Good. Um, so tonight's class is on original sin and the mystery of iniquity and, uh, and divine providence. And, and so in the last couple of weeks, I've gone through like three sections. This is only two sections, which means there'll be a lot more time for discussion at your tables. I'm just kidding. I won't make you do that unless you desire. Um, but, but, it, but there will be more time for questions. I also have some, some other things that I might be throwing in. Um, and we're just going to start with just reading Genesis 3. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals and the Lord God ma- that the Lord God made. The serpent asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, you shall not eat it or even touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God's, who know what is good and what is bad. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes and desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. When they heard the sound of the Lord God moving about in the garden in the breezy time of the day, the man and his wife hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God then called to the man and asked him, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? You have eaten then from the tree of which I had forbidden you to eat. The man replied, The woman whom you put here with me, she gave me fruit. From the tree, so I ate it. The Lord God then asked the woman, Why did you do such a thing? The woman answered, The serpent tricked me into it, so I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you shall be banned from all the animals and from all the wild creatures. On your belly shall you crawl, and dirt shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. To the woman, he said, I will intensify the pangs of your childbearing. In pain shall you bring forth children. Yet your urge shall be for your husband, and he will be your master. To the man, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree of which I had forbidden you to eat. Cursed be the ground because of you. In toil shall you eat its yield all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring to you as you eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face shall you get bread to eat, until you return to the ground from which you were taken. For you are dirt, and to dirt you shall return. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so that story is a really familiar story, right? It's, it's one of those stories that we learned as very small children in, in catechism classes about how sin entered the world, and, and there's all lots of famous artwork of you know, that, that apple, you know, and, and like the, it's the apple's fault. And it leads to all kinds of questions that people can have, right? Like, well, why did God give them the option, <laughs> right? Like, that's the question sometimes people ask is, why did God give them the option? Why didn't he just create them so there was no option? Um, but, but again, like these, these sections from the book of Genesis, like last week we talked about how the creation story, the genre is myth, which means... It portrays truth, and it, it, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit in order to explain a reality that's really hard for us to grasp. And, and the consequence of original sin is also a reality that can be hard for us to grasp, and there's different ways of approaching it, and different theologians approach it in different ways, and, and they answer certain questions in different ways, and, and I'll explore some of those tonight. Um, but the important thing is that we, we recognize that, oh, we all carry this consequence of original sin. Right? We all do. We all carry the consequence of original sin. And, and that means we need a redeemer. And that's probably the most important thing to walk away with is, oh, wait, that means I need a redeemer. 
And, and sometimes when we, we can ignore the fact that we carry the consequence of original sin and then we don't think we need a redeemer. And, and so remember my way of, of sort of illustrating this is through that lens of love that I talked about in the first week and, and just talked about how like when God created us in the beginning, before sin entered the world, right, he created us to be in relationship with him first, right? That God desires our good. He desires our good. And that's really why he tells Adam, don't eat from that fruit, from that tree, because I want the good for you and I want you to belong to me. And, and as long as Adam believes that, he is able to entrust himself to God. And then the temptation that's presented by the serpent is this temptation that God doesn't really love you, right? And, and the temptation sounds a lot like what you know, we hear from maybe your teen, teenagers or, or something like that when they were teenagers. You know, like, you don't let me do anything, right? Because the, the serpent says, did God tell you you can't eat any of the fruit? No, he didn't say not any of the fruit. He just said this one particular fruit. Well, if you eat that, you will not die. You'll be like God. God doesn't really love you. And, and whatever rules he's given you in your life, it's, it's for your bad and not for your good. And, and really that temptation, it's, it's there to cast doubt on the fact that God wants the good for us. It's, casting doubt on the fact that God loves us. Right? And I say over and over and over again that all sin starts with that premise. All sin in our life starts with, I don't really believe God loves me. Or, I don't really believe that God is capable of taking care of me. You know, which is why this lesson is it's also paired with the lesson on divine providence. Right? That God does care for us all the time. Because if we don't believe that God loves us, then we don't entrust ourselves and we end up declaring our autonomy and it ruptures our relationship with him. And, and so in the slides, they're really going into a little more detail and, and maybe in some more academic terms to describe that dynamic. Right? And then once that dynamic happens between us and God, it affects our rela the relationship between the man and the woman. You know, and we see that now she's hard to trust and there's this grasping instead of self-giving. He's hard to trust. There's this grasping instead of, instead of self-giving. And then that relationship becomes ruptured. Right? And all love gets ruptured because, because of original sin. And so, so we remember that God the Father made humankind in holiness and gave us free will. Right? So he made us in his infinite power... He made his infinite power dependent on our free will, so to speak, right? Like, like he has infinite power. He could have forced us to do what he wants, but then he would be a slave and not a, he'd be a slave master and not a father. And, and so he doesn't force us to do anything. He doesn't try to force us to love him, right? Now, some of us might have had people in our life that try to force us to love them. Um, I don't know, I think I've used that example. You know, that one relative that just says, like, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'll, like, say it. Tell me you love me. Right? Like, like sometimes we can have people like that. But, but God doesn't do that with us. He gives us the freedom to respond to him. He endowed us with the capacity to be master of ourselves and to choose rightly. So last week we talked about how we were created with reason and free will. Right? That's what makes us human. That's what makes us unique as human beings, that, that we have this ability to know ourselves, to come to experience ourselves, and to this ability of self-determination, right? Like we have the ability to choose. We're made to yearn for God. And, and some people call that a God-shaped void in our hearts, right? Like God made us to yearn for him. And, and I don't always like that formulation, you know, because, because in the beginning, there wasn't a God-shaped hole. It was just that Adam and Eve were in relationship with God. After original sin, like, the spirit sort of evicted from their hearts, and now they experience the fact that there was once something here, and now it's here. And, and, and I'm not really even sure what that was, you know. And I think that perspective is a little more congruent with our human experiences sometimes. You know, like sometimes in our human experiences, if we've had like abandonment in our life or the loss of a loved one in our life, we can we can experience like there's supposed to be something here, but it's not here. 
you know, like sometimes when I talk to people, like other people who, like myself, had lost a parent at a young age, they, they kind of always feel like, like there's something missing in my life. And, and they experience that kind of void in their hearts. And, and we have that void for God, you know, all of us do, because we're born into the world in this state of original sin. Our first parents received the supernatural endowments of original holiness, original justice, and harmony with themselves and all creation. Right? And so when we were created from the beginning, we were created in original holiness and justice. Like everything was properly ordered. Right? Everything was properly ordered. There was, there was no lust, there was no greed, there was no overeating, there was no like there was just no sin in the world. And and there was harmony with all creation, right? One of the consequences of original sin is that it's a, there's a rupture within ourselves, between our body and our spirit. There's a rupture in the relationships that we have between men and women and the relationships we have with the rest of humanity. There's a rupture between man and the world in the readings, right? You will bring forth the fruit of the earth by the sweat of your brow, right? Like before, you know, farming would have been a lot easier. And then sin enters the world. <clears throat> so God puts Adam and Eve to the test to choose to obey or disobey God's command. You know, and again, that's a familiar way of saying things. Um, but I, don't, I just don't like anything that makes it seem like God is a divine manipulator. You know, like, like don't eat that fruit or you're going to die. And then I'm going to put big neon lights on it that says, eat me. Right? Like, like I don't think God is out to trick us. And, you know, sometimes we think that. We think, like, God's testing me. Like, he's trying to trick me. Um, but, but there is just a test of love that we all go through every single day. You know, like, we all choose. Like, I could say, like, there's a test of my love for God, you know, in that choice I make to get out of bed early enough to say my prayers at the beginning of the day or not. You know, like, and that's a reality. Like, like do I... You know, like, have you ever felt really motivated? Like, I'm going to get to Mass early enough to pray the Rosary before Mass. You know, and then, like, the alarm goes off, and you're like, ah, ten more minutes is good. Right? Like, like sometimes we, we have that, and, and we can say, like, that's a test of our love, and, and it's just, it reveals where we're at. You know, I, I guess that's how I like to say things. It reveals where we're at. And, and, and sometimes we just have to accept where we're at, and ask our Lord to redeem us and, and move us forward. Satan, a fallen angel, tempted Adam and Eve, and they succumbed to temptation, right? And that's what we call original sin. So we can say there was the original sin, which was that first sin committed by Adam and Eve. And, and they were tempted by Satan, who last week we talked about was the first angel ever created, the smartest angel ever created. And, and he had this choice to either right, serve God or not serve God from the beginning of his creation. And, uh, and, you know, there's that famous line, like, it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Like, that's his attitude, right? Like, I'm not going to surrender myself to anybody. I'm not going to listen to anybody. Nobody can tell me what to do. And then he desires, right, for other people to experience the same thing. Right, to experience the same thing. They're not in communion with him. He just desires that they're not in communion with God. Our first parents lost communion with God and their supernatural endowments and sin entered the world, right? So, so what happens after that first sin is they, that communion with God is broken, it's ruptured. And then they lost that, those supernatural endowments of original holiness, original justice, that harmony with creation. In his mercy and love, God promised our first parents a redeemer. Right? So in Genesis 3.15, he says, like to, when he says there will be enmity between the serpent and the woman, right? and you will strike at his heel, but she will crush your head. Right? And so the Lord, from the very beginning, promises a redeemer, right? which reveals God's mercy. So even though we have this consequence of concupiscence and Adam and Eve ruptured their relationship with God, the Lord promises that he's going to redeem them. He promises that. 
You know, and that's something that applies very directly in all of our lives. Every time we fall into sin, our Lord promises that he's going to redeem us. You know, he promises that he's going to redeem us. Sometimes we get stuck in our own spiritual lives when we've been Catholic for a long time because we're like, oh, he's redeemed me. I just like ran out of like times. You know, like I ran out of times. I think I hit 70 times 77 like three years ago. And, uh, and I'm not really sure that he's going to show up again. But he's always going to show up. He always gives us a way out. And, and he always provides a path. Right? He always provides a path. So evil is universal. <clears throat> God does not directly or indirectly cause evil. Right? So God doesn't directly or indirectly cause evil. Right? Evil just kind of like happens in the world. And, and this, these are like hard things for us. But, but that, I think that's a really important point. Because sometimes we fall into this thinking like, well, God must have let that evil happen to you for a reason. Like, I just, I just don't like that. Saint Lisa's like shaking your head up and down right now. Right? Like, I just don't like that. Because, because it turns God into somebody who like does harm to us just to like test us, you know, like just to test us. And, but evil happens, right? It's, it's something that happens and, it, and it's easier to say, like Stanley Hauerbas, he says, like, there, like evil doesn't make sense the same way that creation doesn't make sense, right? Like why did God create? He didn't have to create, he just did. And he did as a free gift. And, and we can try to like figure that out. But at the end of the day, we can't figure it out. Like it just happened. You know, and, and evil things happen. Fallen human nature is a darkened intellect that's subject to error, a weakened will, and concupiscence that produce an inclination to evil so that our entire lives can be a struggle. Right? So, so as a consequence of original sin, we have a darkened intellect that's subject to error. We can think about things wrongly. Right? We can think about things wrongly. And, and that darkened intellect, like sometimes we experience that in our personal sin. Like this one of my favorite things to reflect on is how the things the church believes about original sin, we experience about personal sin. You know, like when, when when I've been in my life enslaved to sin in my past, I had a darkened intellect. I just wasn't thinking about things clearly. Sometimes my memory just wasn't as good. And I was kind of felt like I was walking around in a fog all the time. You know, like people who have addictions, which is basically being enslaved to sin, they have a tendency to forget things. They are, have a hard time being in a relationship. They're, they're just not like present to the world. And they, they miss out on a lot of things that are going around around them. You know, and so we, we can have that darkened intellect that's subject to error. Our will becomes weaker. It's harder for us to say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things. And concupiscence produces an inclination to evil. So, so the consequence of sin is concupiscence, which is just our inclination to do the wrong things. It's like when St. Paul says, I don't do the things that I want to do, and I do the things that I don't want to do. You know, and, and so the entire Old Testament is filled with like all kinds of things. Like immediately after original sin, Adam and Eve start to have children and one of them kills the other one. Like immediately there's that inclination to evil. But God invites us to a blessed life so we can freely accept. God invites us to a blessed life but we can freely accept or turn away from God. Our eternal choice is between good and evil, between sin and holiness, between God and Satan. You now, St. Augustine talks about like living in the city of man or the city of God. And, and he says the city of God is not a location, right? The city of God doesn't have boundaries. It's just like these are the, this is this state of living in relationship with God. And then there are people that are just in relationship with the world. And every choice that we make, it's either a choice that we're in communion with God or we're choosing the world. Right? And choosing the world is choosing the world of sin. And, and that's just the most simple way of looking at the moral life is I'm, I'm either living in relationship with God or I'm not. You know, either I'm letting God love me right now or I'm not. 
either I'm seeking out the Lord as my refuge or I'm seeking out something else as my refuge. I and mean, that's, that's another kind of dynamic that I talk about a lot when, when I'm working with people who have addictions. And people who have addictions, they're just like a kind of caricature of what we all go through when we're falling into sin. And uh, at least that's the way I've experienced it. Um, because, because really, like, you're either going to, like, turn to our Lord for care and for comfort, or you're going to turn to Netflix for care and comfort. Right? And we can all do that. We can all turn to Netflix. You know, maybe it's not Netflix. Maybe it's, like, workaholism. Or, but we all have our thing. Right? We all have our thing. Every person who has reached sufficient use of reason is a sinner. A sinner. So Romans 3.23, St. Paul says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That once we reach the age of reason, which is around seven or eight years old, we have the capacity to choose something other than God. Right? And because we have this inclination, we all tend to at one point or another. Only Mary, to fulfill her unique mission as mother of the Redeemer, has not sinned and was preserved by God's special grace, even from original sin. And so we believe that Mary didn't have all these consequences of original sin and, and that Mary received the graces of the redemption ahead of time, right? ahead of time. Remember, like the first I think it was like the second week we talked about how God is outside of time. And like you could pray now for somebody's conversion in the past. And so what we believe is that Jesus died on the cross. All grace flows from the cross. But those graces were applied in the life of Mary, like ahead of time. At her conception, when she was conceived herself in the womb of her mother, St. Anne. Right? And so Mary is the only one that we can say that about. Evil abounds because Satan is active and we are vulnerable. Right, stay, 1 Peter 5 says, stay sober and alert. The devil is prowling like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in your faith. Right, every week, I think it's on Tuesday, everybody who prays the divine office, which is the prayers that every priest prays every single day, reads that passage. Right, that we remember to be vigilant against him. And sin is the greatest evil in the source of much human suffering, right? Sin is the greatest evil. And, and again, I think that's, a, that's one of those points that it's obvious, but we don't live it out all the time, that sin is the greatest evil. Sometimes people, like, they have lots of questions about, like, exorcisms and possession and demonic oppression and, and or, like, the, the evils that go on in society and, and all of that. And, and that's when our Lord says, like, take the plank out of your own eye before you address the splinter in your brother's eye. Like, the, the thing we have to be most concerned about is our own sinfulness, right? Like, the sin in my own heart. Like, your own conversion has to be your first priority, right? And, and it's not selfish. It's not selfish. It's your own conversion is your first priority. And if our own conversion is our first priority, then... Then we end up like living in a relationship with our Lord, and then we can go and do all these like great things with other people, you know, out in the world. But when we when we haven't had our own conversion yet, well, then then we can end up doing a lot of harm, you know. Like I think about like my own mishaps as a priest, and I'm still gonna have mishaps as a priest. But but a lot of times it was like I wasn't working on my own conversion. I was super preoccupied with other things. And, and I just wasn't available um, to people that needed me. Or I wasn't like, I didn't notice things that I should have noticed. You know, I had one student at Pius, and uh, this was probably one of my biggest priest failures as, uh, as a young priest. And is that, there shouldn't be any shame talking about this. Like, I could have you all turn to your neighbor and share your biggest parent failure. Go. <laughs> right? Like, we all have that. And, and so, like, my big priest failure was, uh, there was there's a particular student, and, um, and, and I just love, like, the obstinate students in class. Like, I just, like, love them. And, uh, and I would just always invite her, like, hey, if you ever want to talk, come see me. And, uh, and she was like, no way, Father, I'm never going to talk to you. And I was like, you're going to talk to me someday. And, uh, and then, you know, the whole year goes by, and she never comes by and talks 
and I was I was kind of a hot mess that year and I didn't like get all my grading done so I just gave everybody full credit um, <laughs> it's what you do so I just gave everybody full credit and I entered the grades in the grade book like it's my fault I, I didn't do it so I gave them full credit there were like 10 point assignments and things like that little quizzes that I would get and um, and in that summer, this student was emailing me and she's like, you never answered me. Like, you never answered my letter. And I, and I don't know what she's talking about. I think she's talking about like, you know, an email she sent that was kind of weird or something. And, and I was just like, I don't even know what she's talking about. And then I get this email, she's like, I am never gonna talk to you or any priest ever again. And, and then I get around to cleaning my desk like six months later and in these papers, like she had like written me a note, right? Worst way to communicate with Father Kokali, by the way, is like slip me a note. Um, but that's what she did, and uh, and I was just like, uh, and I often pray, you know, I often pray that God will send her the person that she needs in order to like repair whatever like damage was done there, because that's all I can do, right? And that's why we have lots of different priests. Right? Because like sometimes I'm the person that gets to repair damage and there's lots of people out there who like I'm sure are repairing the damage that I did. And uh but but it was just an example of like kind of my own like I wasn't working on my own conversion. I wasn't like noticing what was going on around me and, and I missed something. Right? I missed something. And and the more I'm in union with our Lord, like the more I don't miss those things. And actually like when I do miss those things, people just show up and they remind me and like things kind of fall into place more often than not, which is also a huge grace. So Jesus has defeated Satan, conquered evil and given us the hope of salvation, right? God permits evil, but he is not powerless against it. And he can bring good from evil or he can redeem it, right? Like, I'd rather say he can redeem it than he can bring good from it because bringing good from it also makes it seem like, uh, I'm not really sure. Like, but redeeming it is, in a sense, bringing good from it or transforming it into, right, something else. And, and any time we experience evil, like, it, it does put us in this place of testing that, like, am I going to surrender my life to our Lord in this situation or not? Right? Like, am I really going to give myself to our Lord or not? And, but our Lord can redeem everything. Right? Our Lord can redeem everything. Jesus, the promised Savior, came, opened heaven to us by suffering and death, and became our way to God. In coming to redeem us, Jesus brought a greater good than had existed before the fall. Right? And, and that's another theological point that, that I just think is one to ponder right is that like in the beginning everything was good everything was ordered but we actually believe that because god became man and invited us all into relationship with him that now things are better than they were in the beginning like things are better now than they were in the state of original sin like things have the capacity to be better because now like we share god's very life Right? We share God's very life. Like when we're baptized, the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, enters into our body and makes our Lord present there. And just as the Holy Spirit is the bond of love between the Father and the Son in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit binds us to the love of our Lord. The Holy Spirit like, unites us with Jesus. Right? And to be united with God is better than the kind of friendship with God that Adam and Eve had in the beginning. Jesus gives us a superabundance of grace to help us overcome evil, right? Like our Lord always is pouring out grace in order to help us overcome evil. And in every moment of temptation, there is the availability of grace if we have eyes to see it, you know, and if we ask for it. You know, and sometimes that means asking for the right grace. And, and, that, and I don't want to like, activate all the perfectionists in the room who are like, okay, what's the right grace and what's the right words and how do I do it? But, like, for instance, um, and I might have used this example, I think I used this example before, but it's the example of somebody who 
you know, they were really tempted by a situation that they were in, you know, like they were, they were on an airplane with an incredibly attractive woman sitting next to them and they're trying to live a life of chastity and they were really distracted by this incredibly attractive woman. And I was like, so what did you do then? Well, I prayed, Father. Okay, like what did you, what would it look like for our Lord to help you? Like, how did you pray? I said, God help me. Okay, what would it look like for God to help me? She would disappear. <laughs> okay, so that might not be the problem. You know, like she's not the problem. The problem's in your heart, right? The problem's in here. So like you need to be praying for the grace that our Lord transforms your heart and transforms the way that you look at that person and experience that person. That's what needs to change. You know, like, you can't, like, pray like God is going to, like, you know. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, somebody struggles with gluttony. Jesus, you need to give me, like, a smaller stomach. You know, like, or, like, take away all food. Make all food taste like cauliflower. Like, it's not what he's going to do because it's a problem with our heart. And his desire is to transform our heart. Right, to transform our heart. And, and going back to that idea that, that he created us and he's not going to force us to love him. Right? So we always have that choice. And the choice is a choice of where do I line my heart? Where do I put my heart? You know, it's not a matter of like I need like everything, every other option to be taken away from me. It just doesn't, like, that doesn't work. You know, what matters isn't here. And that's the grace he desires to give, you know, which means like praying for a transformed heart. You know, and it's, I think I wrote that into the Thanksgiving prayer after mass in that way. The graces gained by Jesus are given to us by the church through the power of the Holy Spirit, most especially in the seven sacraments. The seven sacraments are a privileged place of receiving our Lord's love and receiving our Lord's grace. You know, and we'll have classes on the sacraments and how the sacraments work, from the work worked. And, but, but the sacrament of baptism is the primary and first way that we encounter God's love and we encounter God's grace. Confirmation is a sacrament that seals us with God's grace. In the Eucharist, like, we come to share one body with our Lord. His body enters our body and becomes one with our body. In the sacrament of reconciliation, every time we go to confession, you know, we're going in order to kind of take ownership of and, and ask for those graces that flowed from the cross. And, and it's really our response to Jesus when he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And, and we go there to make ourselves available to receive that. You know, and we go there in humility and, and we go there to say this is exactly what I've done and, and all of those sacraments they're more efficacious the more that we are vulnerable and the more that we're real about where we're at you know one of those consequences of original sin like that we read in scripture is blame shifting right it's blame shifting it's like when Adam says like God says where, where, where were you uh, I was afraid because I was naked so I hid myself um, okay, like, you're avoiding the question. <laughs> like, where were you? Like, who told you you were naked? There's something more to this story. Like, he's talking about the consequence to avoid telling God what he did. Like, Adam doesn't just say, I ate the fruit. You told me not to eat the fruit. I ate the fruit. I disobeyed you. Now I'm afraid of you. And I have a lot of shame about that. You know, and, and that's something that shows up in our life. It shows up in our life a lot. You ever forget to call like somebody on their birthday and then they're like, oh, I forgot to call them. And then the next day you're like, okay, I'm gonna, call. and then you forget to call them. And then like three days go by and you're like, ah, I can't face the music. <laughs> you know, cause so you like intend to call and say, hey, I'm sorry I missed your birthday, but now I have all this shame like that I did and that I gotta, I have all this shame now. Instead of just saying, I forgot, I love you, I'm sorry, I'm gonna try to make it better. And and so, so like that blame shifting is a consequence, right? And that blame shift shifting, it also wants to identify the problems all out there. It's not in here. 
And so when we go to confession and we're really like honest about who we are, then we have the benefit of hearing those words, I absolve you, and being able to receive them fully. Being able to receive them fully. You know, because sometimes, you know, like somebody can say, Jesus loves you, and the first words in your brain are, yeah, but, you know, or like maybe your spouse says, I love you, and you're like, yeah, but you really shouldn't, like if you knew what was going on in here. And there's no yeah, buts when we're really honest. We have to freely respond to God's grace, right? And, and that's our part. Our part is to freely respond to his grace and to respond to that invitation that he extends. And so like, providence has to do with, okay, the fact that God is really walking with us all the time, right? That God is really walking with us all the time. That there is a purpose for our lives. And, and in the midst of, you know, living in this state of original sin and the places that we go wrong, like our Lord is always there to put us on the right path. And so God, the creator of the universe, didn't simply set it in motion and have nothing further to do with creation. You know, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, that God is not like the divine sort of, like, we don't believe in deism. Deism is when you believe God created the world and now he doesn't care. So God sustains all of creation and cares for his creatures from the least to the greatest. And although the transcendent creator, he's present to his people. And as our Father, God loves us infinitely. Right? And so God created us and he stays involved in our life. Like He never leaves us alone. He's always, always, always attentive to what's going on in our life and what's going on in our hearts. And there can be those moments in our life where we don't feel like he's attentive, but like he's attentive. You know, he is much like you know, when you're a parent and you let your kids go play in the yard and they thought that they were like running free and like, you know, but you were like watching them out the window and making sure like nothing happened. And they don't know that you're watching, but you're watching. Even when our first parents rebelled against God, he cared for them and established a plan for the salvation of all humanity. Right? So even though there was that first rebellion, God cared for them and he established that plan for the salvation of all humanity. Like he decided then right, there was this plan set in place to promise a redeemer that he would send his son into the world to die for our sins. Although infinite and totally self-sufficient, God wants us to know him, love him, and have a relationship with him. He wants us to know him, love him, and have a relationship with him. And God's care for us was so great that he sent his only son to save us through his sacrificial death so that we, his mere creatures, might be restored to his favor. And he continually cares for us with his abundant grace and guidance and indwells with the Holy Spirit in baptism. So our role in God's providential design God is the Lord of all creation and history, and his will is paramount. Yet he permits and seeks our cooperation with him in carrying out his plans. We are his co-workers in human society and in salvation. Right? And so, so God's will is paramount, but he does ask us to cooperate in his will, right? to cooperate in his will. And, and there are ways in which we do that. There are ways in which we cooperate in his will. And when we're doing that well, that's when we really see the fruit of, of our relationship with him and the fruit of what he's doing. And sometimes we don't even realize like that was God's will until like after the fact when we look back in hindsight and things just seem to align. Right? And things just seem to align. And uh, but, it, but it does take our cooperation and our saying yes to things. You know, like, I think about the, um, <laughs> yeah, like the, the Freedom from Pornography Apostolate in the Diocese of Lincoln and, and that, kind of that ministry that I do and, um, and like, how, like, I'm, I'm, like, in Nashville last weekend talking to a bunch of deacons and their wives and, um, and how I got there. 
because it, it's really interesting how I got there because I really got there because um, yeah like there's a narrative that I could present that there was a lot of conflict between me and some of the people who worked for me in the chancery and uh, and I was just waiting for that conflict to resolve or I was waiting for it to get so bad that they would come to me and then I'd be like okay so we can start now and uh, and so but but what happened was um, like for however it happened the bishop got word of this and the bishop decided well like he's not going to be in charge of anybody anymore and so basically I got fired from being in charge of like all these other offices in the chancery and this is like in 2014 and uh, so I, I'm not in charge of youth ministry or evangelization or anything like that anymore and uh and sometimes, you know, like in the church, the way we fire people is this, like we, we try to throw them a bone and make it sound like we're not firing you. We're, we're like, oh, but you're so good at this, you know. <laughs> like you're really good at flowers, so go do flowers. No. Um, so he's like, but you're really good at like teaching and things like that, and I, I just want you to be free to be able to do that. And, and, and so then I started just giving more talks around the diocese. And, and it actually like freed up a lot of my time and space. And, and then I... And then I had like some people come who heard me give a talk, and then all of a sudden they were inviting me to speak at a conference, and, and then I was like on this like circuit of speakers. Um, now, like when the bishop said like I don't want you to be in charge of all those offices, did he think that he was freeing me up to go like give this talk in Nashville last weekend? Like no. But that's what our Lord did. Right, that's what our Lord did. And I had to have a vision to see what our Lord was doing, which was hard for me because I, was, I had a lot of resentment about that. And I remember just sitting out on a porch one day and I was just like, Jesus, I offer you the life where I'm still in charge of evangelization, youth ministry, and all those offices. And I used to ask you into my life with the NFP lady, right? Because that was my office now, me and the NFP lady. Sometimes people laugh when I say that. I guess I just like that. But I just had to do that. And then, then our Lord takes off and he does something different. Our Lord does something different. And, and there's always something new that he's doing. And, and so, like, where God's will is, you know, it's in, it's in a different place. So, <clears throat> like, the other example of that, like, here that I'm super grateful for is, like, the fact that a couple of priests have come here on retreat. And, uh, and I just had, like, another priest call me today. I don't know if he's going to come or not. But like, like how many people thought when the rectory was renovated that it was gonna become like a place where priests fly in from other states to go on retreat? Nobody. But did God know that? I think so. And there's something beautiful in that. You know, there's something good in that. And, and, and so, so understanding like, like how God's providence works like, it is that ability to step back and say, okay, like, there's cooperation in what he's doing. He doesn't save us without our cooperation, right? He doesn't save us without our cooperation. Like, we're called to actively participate in that. And our cooperation with God is not a sign of his weakness, but shows us his magnanimity in respecting our freedom and our dignity as persons. So the fact that we cooperate with God is not a sign of God's weakness. Like, God could do that on his own, but for some reason, he asks us to help him. Some people use the example of, like, when a mom, at, like, lets her daughter help her bake cookies. Right? Like, do you, can you bake cookies by yourself without your four-year-old putting the flour in the bowl? Yes. Is it more beautiful somehow when your four-year-old helps put the flour in the bowl? Sometimes. So our response to God, our faith in God as providential father is a deeper and more personal profession of intimacy than faith in God as creator and the great I am. So our faith in God as a providential father is deeper and more personal than just having faith in God as creator. Because if our faith in God as providential father means that I have a relationship with him and I have to put my faith in him every single day, that I have to trust in him every single day that every single day I'm seeking to place my heart in his hands. That every single day I'm checking in with him. I'm like, Jesus, what do you want to do today? You know, and, and trying to stay vigilant about, like, okay, are we going to do this or are we going to do this? Like, 
like how do you want to arrange our day together and and that building up that kind of interior dialogue with our lord you know that's having faith in god as a providential father we're complete we are to completely trust in god's providential care he can do all things right god can do everything and in prayer, we're to approach the Father as his beloved children, right? He'll meet our needs, and he knows our needs better than we know our needs ourselves, right? Like our Lord knows what we need, and, and he knows how to give good things to his children. And there's that line Jesus uses in the gospel, right? What father would give his son a snake when he asks for a fish, you know? Like he knows what we need. And sometimes I'll have spiritual directees and and like their life will start getting good and, and they'll come in and they'll be like father like everything's good that's, that's bad right like everything's good something bad's gonna happen like i'm waiting for the other shoe to drop okay the shoe doesn't have to drop like what father would give us on a snake when he asked for a fish or a scorpion when he asked for an egg like the lord wants good things for you right he wants good things for you and he knows the path to those good things and and when we cooperate with him, we get to be on the easy path to those good things. Right? The easy path to those good things. And, uh, and that's all on those slides. So I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions. I have a couple more things I could say about like suffering. But questions, comments, questions about anything? Yeah. Larry? You know, ever since I was small, I was always told, you know, kind of like Santa Claus. God's watching you, and you better not do that, because he knows everything. So, what I've kind of heard tonight is, did God know that Adam and Eve was going to eat the fruit before they ate it, even though they were tricked? Or, you know, and then, on the other hand, we're told, always be prepared because you do not know the hour when the thief is coming. Mm -hmm. So at the time when we may pass from this earth or anything, does God know that or do we just all of a sudden it happens no matter how it happens? And like does God know right now how you're going to die? Yes. I think so. That's like the mystery of it that breaks our brains. Yeah. I remember when I was in philosophy and we're studying all this stuff, and I was just like, so God knows now what I'm going to do. How am I free? Am I free? But I could go this way or that way. But he knows, right? Because God's out of time. And, and so, yes, like he sees your whole life at the same time. You know, he sees your whole life at the same time. But, like, in that, in seeing that all at the same time, he doesn't interfere with your freedom, and you still, like, have freedom. And so, like, from our part, like, as we're in time, the, the dynamism is, like, I'm free to fall in love with our Lord. And, and I'm still free to do that or not do that. Right? I'm still free to do that or not do that. Like, and, and I think of small things, right? Like, was I free to, like, follow through on my diet back in May? I was free to. I was free not to. There's lots of times where I didn't do it. Um, like, does it seem like our Lord was relentless about getting me to want to live my life? Yes. Because, like, all kinds of people pray for me. And, like, I, this dude's calling me up. And he's like, I, I'm, I'm getting from God that you're sick. And, like... Like, like all these things, like weird things. And I could have just said, you're a freak show. <laughs> but I didn't do that. And, and, and so like in my experience now, like I've, I've, I would say in my experience, I can say that I, yeah, I've chosen to respond to him. And the most important thing is that we're free to be in relationship with him all the time. Because I think that the way you frame that, like we, with the way we frame it with little kids, it's like fear. You know, like today my, I preached on like duty and love, but there's also fear. All right? So God's always watching you. So you, like the implication in that is you better not do anything wrong. And the implication in that is that he's going to strike you with lightning if you do something wrong. 
I, I mean, the other thing would be like, God's always watching you, so remember to like, you know, say hi to him while you're outside. Or God's always watching you, so like when you're on your swing, just like, you know, you can talk to him. That would be another way of communicating the same thing. And, and then we're just focused on being in a relationship with them. We're just focused on love. You know, and there's the reality of sin. We can choose not to receive God's love. We can choose to reject God's love. People do it all the time. I have done it in my life. Um, but when we're focused on that, like those other questions about am I free or not free, they don't seem to matter as much. I know when I'm not free, and when I'm not free is when I'm more attached to the world than to God. That's when I just blatantly do things I don't want to do. You know, like, so that's when I blatantly watch Netflix until midnight when I need to go to bed early. You know, or other things. Um, and that's when I'm not free. So, so if it goes to that, like, am I, am I free or not? Or is God in control of everything? Is he a divine manipulator? Is he like up there playing like with Monopoly pieces and we're just like in the Monopoly piece? I used to think that when I was a kid. Like God's up there playing, somebody's up there playing a video game and I'm one of the characters, you know? And, and it can, we can experience like that way sometimes. But, um, maybe that answers your question. Some of these things are just a mystery though. There, there actually isn't a like answer there. If we could understand God, then like we would be God. Like, it's the equivalent of your dog trying to figure out the intricacies of your emotional state right now. We can't really do that. Like, they can sense that you need, you know, them to be around. Other question? Yeah, so what's yeah. the response when other people suffer? When people suffer, um, we've all lived the human experience where we've suffered. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, if somebody's not Catholic, they're not religious, or you know, wants to blame God, when people suffer, you know, they're, they're, it's the first thing is blaming God rather than people who are evil, people who are tempted by the devil, or you know, bad things happen because we're human, and evil enters into humans, and so bad things happen. Mm -hmm. So when I so when I go when I look at suffering, I've suffered. Mm -hmm. Everybody has suffered, and so when we try to help, help other people, you know, I, I guess I'm just looking for the best response because some of the things you're saying is like, yeah, I say say that or that or that. Um, but I know that through my own suffering, there's been a tremendous amount of redemption. There's as I look back, it's like, oh my gosh, God, God knew, He knew that I, I need to, this stuff. And so it's not that I would say, I would say that, well, I mean, you know, if you look at Ignatius' te teachings, we know there's consolation and desolation, and you know there's that cycle and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we, we know there's going to be good, we know there's going to be bad, we know there's, you know, whatever. And, and we can always rely on God to, to, to bring us through that. So I just look at how do we help people? You know, what, what is a good response? I think sometimes, like, like, I think where you're going, Jill, is right that like you know your experience of suffering mm -hmm. and so when somebody else is suffering you're capable of having compassion which means you're capable of absorbing their suffering and being with them in it and walking with them in it and and as they're ready to like place God's love there and, and so, like, sometimes the only thing you can say is, like, I'm sorry for what you're going through right now. And to, and to just be there with them. Um, and, and, and because sometimes, and I'm not saying this is everybody in all ways, but, like, I've experienced this, too. And other people that I've worked with have experienced this. Like, like when somebody is su suffering, like, like, they found out their husband's cheating on them. Let's use that example because it's just that there's going to be an obvious way that this is illustrated. Half of their friends say this. You need to drop them, just get a divorce, get him out of your life. Half of the people say this. You need to forgive him and just move on because Jesus would forgive him and you need to forgive him. Neither of those people 
are willing to walk with that person in their pain. Right? Like both of them are looking for a quick solution because like your pain is reminding me of my pain and that could happen to me and I don't want to think about that could happen to me and so you just need to do this and get over it. And, and people, people, people take, they have their own timeline and, and that. And, and so like Mary has perfect compassion and, and that's like Mary's suffering, right? Mary's suffering is like your heart too, a sword will pierce. And Mary has perfect compassion because she has perfect love. And, and so Mary is like a mother of empathy, which means like she feels all of our Lord's feelings and, and experiences that with him. And and so in a way, like, she's there to help absorb, like, there needs to be a community of care that can help absorb that person's, that person's pain. You know, like, what's the best thing you can do for somebody, like, who has a family member who died? You just, like, bring them food and you sit with them. And that's, that's kind of all that people need or that they want right now. And, um, and, and if they want to blame God, like, yeah, I can totally see how you would want to blame God. In fact, God gave us words to blame God in the Psalms. There are specific Psalms that are written for when you want to blame God for your problems. Like Psalm 22 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I am a worm and not a man. You answered all these other people, but you never answer me. And, and it just like gets it all out. And then there's this movement to, okay, but I'm gonna put my faith in you. And, and so there are Psalms of lament and it's important to lament. And, and sometimes I think we can lack patience with people who are mad at God. It's okay to be mad at God. Monsignor Esif, who's a very famous spiritual director in the United States, he's like an exorcist and it's just the character. And anyway, he he would like tell people like, sounds like you're mad at God. And he's like this gruff guy. You know? He's like, you need to go into chapel and just let him have it. <laughs> just go in there and scream like a little kid. And, uh, and, and sometimes that's what we need to do because that's where we are. It's honest. And then he can respond to us. And, and so, so yeah, we might get to that place of, you know, like when this happened to me, this is how I felt, this is what I went through, this is what I can see in hindsight, right? But I, but I understand that right now you can't see that. Right? But, in, but I can see now that like there, were, there was something really good that our Lord wanted you to do to redeem this. You know, like sometimes people will say to me, and I've said this before, like, well, thank God that he gave you such a dysfunctional family <laughs> so you can be a priest for other dysfunctional families. And I'm like, I, I don't want to think that God did that to me. You know, like, I, he didn't do that to me. It was my family, and he redeemed me. And he showed up. And thank God that I had the eyes to see that, that he showed up. Like my parents were church hoppers and we hopped to a church where the youth minister just happened to walk up to me when I was like working a booth at the bazaar and he, he invited me to youth group and that changed like the course of my like life in high school. Just like one dude who had a choice. I can either invite this kid to youth group or I'm not going to say anything. And he did. And he cooperated with God's will in that moment. Know, and I've had other priests that, like, in my life that are, they're, they're, they hurt me deeply. You know, the priest who sent me here in Lincoln, like, in some ways, like, hurt me, like, emotionally and some things like that. And, and yet, like, he was cooperating with God's will in sending me here because I do believe I'm supposed to be here. You know, like, my brother was at Mass today. My brother would never be, like, a doctor in psychology in Des Moines, Iowa, if I wasn't a priest in the Diocese of Lincoln. There's just things that, that he did. And we can see that later on. You know, 
but but also it's an, I think it's important also to remember that like like our Lord can always redeem our story and when he redeems it it's better than it would have been because sometimes we think oh I messed that up I messed up that choice messed up that choice now I'm playing like triple Z but he can like put it, put it back up there Greg you just said something that you cooperate with God right mm-hmm and it comes from suffering or something bad. Is there a way to know other than hindsight that you actually were cooperating with God and doing what God wanted? The only way to know is the fruit. Like, you know by the fruit. So, like, you can you can look at things, like, academically and say, like, well, this is what was the church teaching, da, da, da. but, like, like, the only time I would say, like, I know I was cooperating with God is when I see the fruit. And, and, where's the, and what's the fruit? Because, like, even when I'm praying with somebody and, and like, like, we kind of start with, oh, there's this agitation here. Then we're going to invite Jesus into that place. And, and then we want to go back and check is that agitation still there or not, or is there peace? You know, and so the fruit can be like the peace that we carry in our own hearts, or is there still anxiety there? The fruit can be like that this situation, like something really good actually happened there. Um, and like I know also like the fruit of when I probably wasn't cooperating with God, you know, which is like ruptured relationship with my sister, you know, when I didn't go to her wedding like for years like I'm like uh, there, there, there wasn't really fruit from that you know? my expected fruit was I was going to say I'm not coming to your wedding and she would be like oh my gosh I can't believe it I'm going to be Catholic again because <sighs> you're not coming to my wedding like n- I never heard that story um, and, and so so you just like yeah it's just the fruit and, and there's I would say like if there's a question about a specific situation like to find somebody for like a spiritual direction appointment and talk through it and kind of look at that. You know, but it's kind of one of those things, like if it's a question, then I'd, I'd say there's probably something more that the Lord wants to do there. You know, it's kind of like one of those things, like people say, like, somebody says, like, how do I know if I'm an alcoholic? Well, like, normal drinkers don't ask if they're an alcoholic or not. <laughs> like, if you're not an alcoholic, you don't ask, like, am I an alcoholic? Like, it doesn't occur to you to ask that question. Some other, yeah. Pardon. Have we talked about original sin? When, you know, when you're born, and the only way to get rid of original sin is through baptism. Right. What about those that don't have the chance to get baptized? So those who don't have the chance to get baptized, we do believe in things like the baptism of desire, which means that, like, we have the ability to know God through like observing nature. Like we can intuit that there's a God. The baptism of desire is like somebody would want to be baptized if they knew, right? If they knew, Um, like they would want to be baptized if they knew. Um, And then there's also like baptism of blood, which is like if somebody dies for the faith then, and they're not baptized, like they're, they're good. Um, But, yeah, so, so like there is a possibility that people are saved through the baptism of desire. Now, oftentimes I pray the Eucharistic prayer four where we pray for people who seek the Lord with a sincere heart is one of the petitions. Um, and, and so, yeah, so that would be the answer to that one. So like small children or something like that that don't have a nearly... Or, you know, like a child who dies before they were baptized right. um, like they're again so some theologians would apply baptism of desire to that situation right like if they knew um, and and could choose they would choose and and I think that's another situation of like continuing to pray for that Result. Like, is baptism necessary for salvation? Like, we say, yes, baptism is necessary for salvation. Like, is there a way in which, like, those graces can be applied? Yes. Does, do we know how that works exactly? Like, God does, like, knows more than we do. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah
which is why it is important for us to try to you know baptize our children like as soon as possible when we have them. So again, I would say like if there's a specific question, like that's a great thing to make an appointment with like somebody for spiritual direction and then go into detail about. So, but I remember like in my own prayer life, like thinking to myself, like, am I just like talking to myself and, and just like imagining these things? And, and so for me, it's usually when something happens in my prayer that I wouldn't normally imagine happening. You know, because sometimes, you know, I'll be with someone and, and they just really don't believe that God cares about them. And I'm like, okay, why? And we, and we, so we're doing this meditation and I'm like, imagine yourself being like a little kid and, and Jesus is there. And, and then I might say something like, just like imagine yourself holding up your arms. What does Jesus do? And well, Jesus like picked me up and he carried me around and, and their, their heart was like filled and and, uh, and they were like, Father, I, well, how do I know I didn't just make that up? I was like, if you made it up, Jesus would have said, like, pull up your big girl pants. <laughs> because that's what you think Jesus would do. Does that make sense? Right? And so, so, like, the thing that, like, we make up the things that sound like us. And, um, and yeah. And so, again, like, that's really a question, like, in the spiritual direction. I wish there was like a checklist of like this, 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 this. Typically, like if there's the fruit, then the fruits are usually like there's peace, right? a sense of peace, anxiety. Like sometimes I know I'm going down the wrong road in my prayer because I just feel agitated about it. And it's usually when I start off by telling our Lord all my plans. Like, like I remember sitting with him and being like, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and we're going to do this and da, 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 da. and I just felt like really unsettled and then I just kind of stepped back and I was like Jesus what do you want to do like let's start with what you want and then he was just like uh, I just want people to know that I love them that's it right now and I was like oh okay and, and so, so it was like starting with like Jesus what do you want to say so so it's a thing we can do in relationships, you know, like is like Jesus, what do you think about this situation? You know, or where are you at with this situation? And where are we on it? Other questions? Yes, what is STLC? License in Sacred Theology. These are fancy letters after my name that I used to put after my name all the time. Because I needed to feel important. <laughs> it's like eight fifteen. There's not a lot of time left, so good enough. I can't tell what your blank space is. It's okay. Name the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we ask your blessing upon each of these your sons and daughters, and just ask for the grace to to recognize you as you operate in our lives every day. Help our hearts to be open and discerning and recognizing the times in which that you you do show up in our life, in our hearts, in our prayer. Give us greater freedom from sin, from fear, from doubt. And help us to live in your peace. And through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and all the saints, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. I think there's cookies over there that look amazing.